of the Holocaust Resource Center and Diversity Council at Kane University. We are so excited that you're all with us tonight for the special program on recognizing hate speech and symbols. This program has been put together by the Holocaust Resource Center, the Human Rights Institute, and the School of Communication, Media, and Journalism of Kane University. And we are just so excited to see such a wide representation from both our Kane undergrads, the teachers who are in our graduate programs, including the post -back, and community members in multiple countries. So the way tonight's program is going to work is we are going to begin by introducing our two speakers. We're going to start with Tiffany Case. Tiffany is the graduate assistant for the Human Rights Institute. And she is also a MA student in the studio program at Kane. Um, then there is Eric English. Dr. English studies political persuasion, political argument, and debate. And his dissertation is well suited for the topic of tonight's program. He looked at how presidential candidates, Senator Barry Goldwater, and Representative Ron Paul rhetorically deployed the concept of freedom by defining it with the notion of dependence. And Dr. English is an adjunct professor in the College of CMJ, as well as at Fordham University. Goodness gracious, he's also my husband and sitting upstairs, which is why there's a baby on my lap. So I thank everyone for their patience as we did that. Each of our speakers is going to speak for approximately 15 to 20 minutes. And then we are going to have an opportunity for some moderated questions and Q&A. Everybody, feel free to use that chat box at the bottom to put questions in, comments, um, and we'll be sure to get to those later in the program. And without further ado, Tiffany, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um... Yes, yeah, so uh, again, as Adara said, my name is Tiffany. I am um, in the Studio MA program. I am a the graduate assistant at the Human Rights Institute, and I have been working with um, Adara and Dr. English to develop my presentation, um, which I will pull up now. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I'm assuming everyone can see my screen pretty well. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure. Um, okay, great. So, so many little things. Yep, I see it. Okay, great. Um, so, um, I will be doing my presentation on um, what I call the rabbit hole. Um, uh, and the purpose of the presentation is um, recognizing the influence of far-right ideology on the internet which is then going to transition to Dr. English's talk more on um, hate speech and the psychology of that. Um, so uh, I have a couple people up here. Um, on the top left is Richard Spencer. He was a pretty prominent white nationalist, um, white supremacist. He's actually kind of faded out of public view um, as of late. Um, here in the middle is Nick Fuentes, who is still pretty popular amongst the online world of the alt-right. Um, he created the American First Political Action Conference, uh, which is described as white nationalist. And on this far right is a guy named Peter Sivanovic, um, who kind of became the de facto face of the um, far right. Um, and that was at the Charlottesville rally in 2016. Um, so why am I um, talking about this? Like, why is this important? Um, it's that um, if you've kind of been tracking online, um, the world of online culture, um, you've noticed that um, uh, the reactionary right has kind of developed and it has reached the mainstream in ways that we don't see with like the, the far left. Um, it's become increasingly apparent on internet public spaces. Um, and this is my um, interpretation of why was it was triggered um, in the around 2010 
with the advent of progressive liberal views of gender identity and sexuality, as well as racial justice with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which reacted a which elicited a re reactionary response. Um, and then far left ideas are also being proliferated. You know, they're a whole political spectrum, but they just haven't gotten mainstream really. Um, uh, social media and entertainment sites are um, beginning to crack down on hate speech, if you've noticed. Um, uh, specifically, it's been like conservatives who've been moved off of things like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We know that it was like there's an issue with like misinformation, like during the election. Um, so they moved, they moved to platforms like Gab and Parler and Maybe, which are kind of like diff kind of like de facto more like conservative spaces. Um, and things got really bad in the late 2010s, so much so that YouTube pulled like over 100,000 videos and like 500 million YouTube comments. They purged them due to a revised hate speech policy. So things actually, they started kind of benign, but they've actually kind of ramped up um, over time. And then we're gonna talk about 4chan poll. So some of you are like, I don't know how much you all know about this world, but we'll be talking about that. And um, the rabbit hole, um, it's not an official term. I just use it because it kind of describes political extremism well, kind of symbolizing the further you get down, the further away from reality you are. Um, okay, so if I could move, oh, I can move this. Okay, so um, far right and alt right are slightly different. Um, far right refers to anything neo fascist, right wing ideology that invariably invokes anti Semitism, ultra nationalism, authoritarianism, Nazi influence, and white supremacy. Alt right, I would describe it as far right junior. So it's a mostly online youth, youth movement, young, kind of mostly white men, more internet savvy. Um, they treat politics more as kind of like entertainment a little bit, but they do have far right views. Um, basically group hatred is the defining trait of a far right um, political worldview. It seems to be less interested in economics and stuff like that more so than how they want the world to be racially. So you get virulent anti-Semitism, which tends to be pretty, pretty extreme. Um, nativism and ultranationalism, where a uh, nation should only serve the interests of the white and native born, like in a country like the United States. Um, ironically, though, they don't want to include Black Americans as who are the descendants of slaves. Um, of course, very anti-immigration. And then that is couched within um, general racism. So genetic superiority over the white race and everyone else uh, is pretty much, they have criminal intent and, and low intelligence. And the bottom, let me move this down here. Um, at the bottom here, oops. Um, this bottom left image is the symbol of the Grapers, who are the followers of Nick Fuentes. They're like the alt-right. Um, they're loosely, you know, connected alt-right reactionaries. They will troll ne neoconservatives or mainstream conservatives. Like they'll go to conventions and like antagonize people speaking and, or like they'll troll people on Twitter. Um, and then on the other end here, so this is the symbol of Golden Dawn, which is a political party in, in Greece, which is described as fascist and neo-Nazi. Um, they just, there was recently a, a, like a criminal trial for like the leader of them. So like you do see like there's, there are some differences here. Um, and then, Okay, so I wanted to just show you how, how apparent this is becoming. If you just go on YouTube, search anything on Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, or videos portraying Jewish people negatively, and you'll see 
you know, mass dislikes. You know, I promise you, it's not because people disagree with the con uh, the production. You know, this is a this is ideological. Um, and then if you look in the comments, you'll see them all. Uh, all these uh, the uh, reactionary kind of far right leaning comments. This person appears far right socialist atheist, so it's very obvious. Um, they all do tend to start to blend together a bit. Um, so they are still here on, on YouTube, but they've have been limited, but still. Um, if you go enough into the world of internet politics, you'll notice some specific words being brought up a lot. Um, so the term goy and goyim. So if you ever see someone in political comments using that word, it's actually a Yiddish word for a Gentile or a non-Jew. And they use it um, mockingly, or they use it ironically, because it refers to certain anti-Gentile attitudes you find in rabbinic work which itself is a, a whole complicated topic, but they'll use that. Um, this, these little things, they're called echoes. Um, you just put the name of a Jewish person in the echoes and that's how they are able to communicate that someone is Jewish. Uh, although it's now becoming so obvious that anti-anti-Semites are now using it too. Um, and then globalist, kind of another code word for a Jewish person. Uh, they believe that secular Jews are controlling the world. Um, and then oive, you know, I promise you when you see the word oive, it's not being used by a Jewish individual speaking Yiddish, it's, it's being used mockingly. Um, so my next slide, okay, these are going to be uh, some memes that are anti-Semitic and very racist. <laughs> so, um, Memes are huge in, in communication today. Like our generation, like we love them. That's, it's just a shorthand for explaining views. Um, two groups in my observation seem to get the most, the most heat, um, Jewish people um, and black Americans, Africans, Africa diaspora. Um, and they're kind of diametrical in that Jews are often portrayed as overly intellectual, conniving, nefarious, um, you know, controlling um, negative aspects of society. And then um, black people are portrayed as primitive, low IQ criminals. And these are actually the most tamest ones I could find. They like, they only get worse from here. So uh, I believe that 4chan kind of was like the um, foundation for a lot of what we see now on like the web as far as like what is very apparent. Anyone can go to the politically incorrect board on 4chan, um, but just be warned that it is has become an ex extremely volatile place. Um, it was, uh, the site was created in 2003 and over the past almost 20 years, it's become more and more like right-leaning. Um, in 2011, poll was created because uh, neo-Nazi white supremacist types were starting to like spam other boards and the administrators decided to just try to move them to their own board. Um, this is according to a Vice Motherboard article on it. Um, and then like in 2016, like since then, um, it is now just like the, <laughs> it's actually so bad that some people have wondered if it's something like a honey pot where like um, federal, like the federal government can try to look at it um, to try to discern if there is any terrorist activity. The members of the board are all very aware of this and very paranoid of this. Um, uh, and also, you know, not to be too alarmist, but there are some people who do fully intend to move 
these concepts into the mainstream by pushing what is called the Overton window to the right. So they will, what they try to do is hit normal people like moderates um, who are having some racist, who may be having some racist thoughts. <laughs> and, and then they will like ambush, troll, raid, um, just try to influence normal discourse. So, okay. Um, and as far as why, um, very complicated issue, but I have some ideas that maybe we can talk about. One, the internet has just allowed for more instant communication. That's pretty obvious. Um, identity, like our, our generation's concept of identity has really um, kind of um, changed. Um, and we, like I said before, we are seeing a move towards more progressive ideals of identity, like gender, sexuality, and racial justice. Um, and what it has created is a very um, discontent opposition. And um, mostly white men, but there are actually other, you know, people with different racial identities who do get, um, who are also in there, um, will feel pitted against the rest. And this is creating a very toxic in and out group dynamic. Um, and then the uh, changing demographics of the US, you know, like, uh, I think I, a Pew poll said that, like, I think half of Americans under 16 are now non-white. So this is creating a lot of anxiety over white hegemony. And then of course, it was the presidency of Donald Trump, which <laughs> did animate um, a lot of young people on the internet to form like the alt-right. Individual perception is also really huge here. Um, my, uh, there is something I looked up called siege mentality, which is a defensive or paranoid mentality where you anticipate hostility from others. Like you are, you are anticipating that there will be harm done to you. Um, so there's also a lot of um, isolation and rejection from society or family. Uh, now, a lot of people experience this. Like, uh, I, I consider myself to be a bit of a loner and I've always felt different, but people will experience isolation in different ways. Um, and some people, uh, you know, especially in circumstances where they are like very much rejected will, will turn on society basically. So society has rejected me. So I will in turn reject its normative values, right? Um, the fear of vulnerability. So, so this is, this is like, for, for people who bully, like, in real life, but also online. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, if you position yourself above others, then nobody can hurt you. So like, why do you think people antagonize others needlessly? Well, it's because if I, if I antagonize others, they, they'll be too afraid to antagonize me. Um, cognitive distortion is like, in this case, uh, society has structured itself in an irrational manner. Everything is wrong is being embraced and everything right is rejected. And then lastly, retribution. For someone who has experienced, um, like, like honestly, you know, a lot of, uh, I think white men do feel antagonized, um, which is just something, I'm, I'm not a white, man, but if you actually see their thoughts, their posts, their videos, like they feel that they are under, these certain people are under siege in a lot of ways by these societal changes. So I will gain power by tearing down those that I perceive are my enemy. So uh, yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Um, 
what is the solution is something we should talk about. I'm not exactly sure what that solution is, but um, if anyone is interested, I do have my work cited of just some um, information I have, um, you know, I use to create this presentation here. So thank you for letting me share this. I will now go back to the conversation. All right, so it's all good on my end. Excellent, and Dr. English, please. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna share my, uh, share my screen. Everyone can see that now. I'll bring the title to the forefront. Uh, first of all, thank, I, I wanna thank all the uh, co-sponsors of this event. So the, um, the Holocaust Resource Center and Diversity Council, which is of course run by my wife Adara, thank you very much for, uh, for hosting this event. Uh, and also the, um, the School of Communication, Media and Journalism, uh, where I teach as well. So this is a little bit of a, a family reunion for me. Uh, and also the Human Rights Institute, um, which works very closely with the Holocaust Resource Center. Uh, and they are um, frequent collaborators. Uh, and thank you to Tiffany for setting, setting up what I'm going to say beautifully. Um, this is very much a talk about how people end up going down the rabbit hole. Uh, what is it that leads them down the rabbit hole? And how do people end up going from being sort of a you know, seemingly normal, maybe garden variety, a little bit implicit racist to being um, you know, off the deep end, hate speech, uh, maybe even hate crime sort of racist. Uh, and so, um, yeah, with, um, and, and of course, thank, I wanna thank everyone for being here as well. So, uh, so let's start just by uh, talking about what hate speech is. Right? Um, so hate speech is any public speech that attacks, humiliates, or dehumanizes members of groups on the basis of things like race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, religion, ethnicity, nationality, disability, uh, etc. Uh, it is a it is a legal category. Um, it, in almost every state, there are um, um, there are hate crime um, laws on the books, but there are not hate speech laws, and that's because in the U.S. it is still considered a form of protected speech under the Supreme Court's current interpretation of the First Amendment. So, the Supreme Court takes a pretty broad view of what should be allowed as speech. They, there are certain exceptions, like incitement to violence, is not allowed. Um, shouting fire in a crowded theater, right? There are some exceptions, but they're fairly narrow exceptions. And uh, hate speech is not one of those exceptions. So it's, it's a form of protected speech. Um, now that protection does not extend to incitement of violence, uh, which is not a form of protected speech. And so it's important that we don't confuse hate speech with uh, hate crimes, which are prohibited by federal law and also by most state laws as well. I think there's only one state that does not have uh, some form of hate crime statute on the books. So if you're going to think about um, hate speech uh, like a communication scholar, um, we need to think about audiences for that speech uh, and the purposes of the speech. Uh, who is it trying to reach? What message are um, hate speakers trying to send? Uh, the first and most obvious audience for the hate speech is the targets of that speech. The goal, uh, I think, is to, to terrorize those, right? Members of minority groups, to make them afraid to go out in public, to make them afraid to speak their mind, to make them afraid to speak up online because of what may happen to them. Uh, and so it creates a culture of fear and of silence. Um, I think that that's, it's important to say that that's the, you know, that's the, the biggest impact of hate speech. Uh, but in order for hate speech to replicate, to spread, it needs to also 
do a couple of other things. It needs to win over persuadables. It needs to take folks who, as we said before, you know, start down that rabbit hole uh, toward uh, radicalization. And also uh, to mobilize adherence, right? people who are already radicalized, already have extreme views to get them to become more vocal um, and to maybe even go out and commit actual physical violence as well. Now remember that actually inciting violence, actually telling people to go out and commit violence is illegal. And so when incitements to violence occur, they usually either happen in private channels online where it's, it, they, they try to hide it from the authorities or they do so in a way that's, that the incitement can only be inferred. Uh, and so that is a, that's actually a, a, a rhetorical technique known as an enthymeme. So this is a, a Greek term that was posited by Aristotle actually as one of the most powerful forms of persuasion there is. Uh, and so there's something ironic here that because incitements to violence have to be implicit rather than explicit, that actually makes them more powerful. So here's an example of this. Imagine um, there's a court case and the, the defendant is on trial uh, and the prosecutor just keeps bringing up character witness after character witness saying, this is a really bad guy. He's hurt people in the past. He's been, a, he's been convicted of things in the past. He's, you know, he owes lots of people money. He's done all of these horrible things. The one thing that the prosecutor would never do is get up and say, look, this, is, this guy has done bad things in the past, so therefore he's guilty of this crime. Right? Because the, audit, the jury would then say, no, that's not true at all. You know, just because he's done bad things in the past doesn't mean he's guilty of anything you accuse him of. But the prosecutor doesn't say that. They just sit down and let the jury draw their own conclusion. The jury is very likely to come to the conclusion, this is a bad guy, he's probably guilty. So by not stating a premise of an argument, by leaving it unsaid, oftentimes that argument becomes even more powerful. Uh, and this is, you know, this goes against our common sense. This goes against our intuition, but uh, it's this, implicit nature of the argument that makes it more powerful. Um, so when it comes to the difference between these last two functions of uh, the second and third functions of hate speech that I mentioned before, persuasion and mobilization, in most cases, social media is terrible at persuasion and really good at mobilization, right? So, if you've ever tried to change someone's mind on a political issue on Facebook, you probably know what I mean by this, right? Um, it usually backfires. It usually doesn't go very well. Um, and so social media is not necessarily a great place to persuade. It is, however, a very good place to mobilize for people who already agreed with one another to come together and plan events uh, and you know, make actions actually occur in the world as a result of those shared beliefs. So bad, it's generally bad at persuasion, generally good at mobilization, but persuasion does occur. Um, it's a process. Uh, and so this is why I think the metaphor that Tiffany used of the rabbit hole is particularly apt, right? You, you, it takes a while to, <laughs> once you enter that hole, it takes a while to get to the bottom of that hole. Uh, you don't just go in the hole and just fall to the bottom immediately. And so the most obvious symbols of hate, so imagine the most obvious symbols like a swastika or a burning cross, they don't win converts. Right? They're, not, they're not persuasive to people who are on the fence or are anti-racist or, or anything like that, right? Um, you see it and you just push it away. And if anything, you become even more um, against uh, hate speech as a result of seeing these obvious symbols of hate. What actually wins over converts, what actually persuades people are, are more complex messages somewhere in the middle, right? messages that sort of muddle things, uh, that lead folks down a path down the rabbit hole toward something very extreme like hate speech. So one way of thinking of this is uh, something called social judgment theory. 
Uh, this was posited by social scientists in the 50s, uh, Carolyn Sheriff, Musiver Sheriff, and Carl Hubland, who talked about uh, latitudes or zones of acceptance, rejection, and non-commitment. Now, the idea here is that you don't just agree or disagree with something. There's a whole span of different positions you could take on an issue. Um, and there's a range of positions similar to your own uh, that you're willing to accept. There's another range of positions far away from your own that you reject. Now, what's interesting here is that when you hear a message, you, you judge that message and judge whether that message is your own or not, whether it's something that is acceptable to you. And we all sort of make an error when we do this. So one error is the contrast effect. Uh, the, the contrast effect says that um, if you hear a position that you disagree with, you perceive it as being farther away from your own than it actually is. So someone may be articulating a fairly moderate position, but one that you disagree with. And so you see it or you hear it instead as a very extreme position that you strongly disagree with. Assimilation is the opposite error. It's another error in judgment. So this is, this is what happens when you hear someone articulate a position that is kind of near your own, but you mistake it as your own. You think that because it is fairly close to being your own, it is in fact yours. So on the right side of the screen, there's kind of a visual uh, depiction of what this looks like. So the anchor, imagine the anchor is the, the listener's own position on gun controls. On, on gun control. So they have this latitude of acceptance. Any of the positions um, that are depicted by the numbers two, three, and four are within this person's latitude of acceptance. If they hear any of these positions, they'll accept it as their own. Anything that is in either one, right? So there, there's, a, there's, a lat there's two latitudes of rejection here. One to the left of this person's um, position and a whole set of positions to the right as well. And this is the latitude of rejection. These are the positions that someone will just dismiss out of hand. And in fact, perceive as being much more different from their own position than they actually are. So take for instance, the position um, under number six here, gun handling course. So I think the idea is uh, the person hearing the message is a, is a pretty big advocate of gun control. They hear someone say, people should be required to take gun, gun handling courses in order to own guns they hear that as a strongly pro-gun statement, when in fact it's meant as a fairly moderate position. Um, and so what, what this seems to indicate, if we take this depiction and this understanding of social judgment theory uh, on face value, it seems to indicate that the way to pull someone down the rabbit hole toward extremism, toward hate speech is to over time, right, just keep sort of moving this anchor, move it a little bit farther every time they hear a message and the latitude of acceptance would sort of move with it, right? The range of acceptable positions moves slowly farther to the right so that someone falls down the rabbit hole by hearing positions that are a little bit like their own, that they kind of mistake as their own and they move farther and farther toward hate speech over time. And, but that is if you accept this particular understanding of social judgment theory. And what I'm gonna do now is sort of, um, sort of complicate that, right? Um, that, um, oh, and one other thing I should point out is that um, if this is true, this is a big problem because the, the more ego involvement people have, the more they care about an issue, the smaller their latitude of acceptance gets the fewer positions they're willing to accept as being reasonably close to their own, which means that as they radicalize, as they move farther and farther toward the other end of this spectrum, the, your ability to bring them back um, erodes. Right? It becomes much, much harder to bring them back out of the rabbit hole because there's no way to gradually pull someone out of the rabbit hole once their latitude of acceptance has gotten really narrow. Right? You need a fairly wide latitude of acceptance to be able to start this process. All right, so let me, I'm going, I'm going to sort of complicate this view in a couple of ways. The first is that 
One flaw of this model is that political views just don't fall along a one-dimensional political spectrum. Uh, so you may have seen things like this, uh, what's on the screen now, right? The political compass, that there are sort of two dimensions of political thought. Uh, one is economic rights, the other is uh, cultural rights, right? Um, and so you've probably seen different versions of this. This is just one version that I found of what a political compass might look like. Uh, and so instead of being points along one particular um, along one particular spectrum, we can think of political positions as being all over the all over a map, right? existing spatially across two dimensions instead of across just one dimension. So that that complicates things a little bit when it comes to latitudes of acceptance and rejection. Um, more importantly, the way we evaluate arguments, the way we are persuaded, often has very little to do with political positions. It often has very little to do with um, the way that particular, um, that particular visualization of, of, of social judgment theory showed 11 different positions on, on gun control. Instead, we are usually persuaded on the basis of our identity in a particular group. Now, that identity doesn't have to be race or religion or gender. It could be class. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, it could be all sorts of different things. It, it could be you're a, uh, you're a fan of a particular sports team. And so we're often more likely to be persuaded on the basis of ethos and identity of the speaker, what the speaker stands for. Is this speaker someone who's like me? Um, do I belong to a, a group that should be doing certain things that believes certain things? And this is often how we, we end up being persuaded as opposed to being persuaded about the benefits and disadvantages of, of particular political positions. So this notion that identity uh, and identification uh, is core to persuasion um, was articulated really clearly by Kenneth Burke, a great 20th century poet and rhetorician who said that Identification is affirmed with earnestness precisely because there is division. Identification is compensatory to division. If men were not apart from one another, there would be no need for the rhetorician to proclaim their unity. So in other words, we feel apart from one another, we need group membership. And so if we're told, if you just believe this way, you can be part of the club, you can be part of the group, you can be like me, you can trust me because I'm like you. This is very often how persuasion actually occurs. And so if that's the case, then moving along a spectrum of positions, especially along a one dimensional spectrum, isn't really what's going on, right? Um, something a little bit more complex than that is happening. And so we need to amend social judgment theory to account for this. So I would like to um, propose that once we recognize these points, once we recognize that there's not just a one dimensional political spectrum and that people are in fact persuaded more on the basis of identity or identification, I should say, right? Not your, not some natural identity that's just given to you by birth, but an identity that is socially constructed and is articulated by a speaker. Um, it becomes clear that, that persuasion is not a linear process. Right? You're not just moving down the line toward extremism. Big jumps can happen. You could start on one place and end up somewhere else, right? Uh, without passing through all the different positions in between. So if you think of, for instance, uh, a shoots and ladders game board, right? Sometimes you're, you're moving along the game board, you hit a ladder, you hit a shoot, and all of a sudden you're somewhere else on the board. Or uh, if you look at the um, the screenshot of, of Super Mario Brothers that I included, right? There are warp zones where you suddenly jump from one level to another level without passing through all the levels in between. And so these are sort of like wormholes or, or nodes where you jump from, from one position to another. So a skillful persuader can sort of find these nodes, can find these wormholes and take advantage of them on the basis of identity. So I know that sounds a little abstract, so let me give you some some examples of how this, this might work. So 
one such conduit, one such wormhole that I'd like to posit is conspiratorial thinking. So conspiratorial thinking fits more comfortably on the right side of the political spectrum, but it has certain resonances on the left. So think, for instance, of anti-vaccination activists, right? Uh, most anti-vaccination activists we associate with the political right, but there are some on the left as well. So RFK Jr., for instance, is a very prominent um, anti-vaccination activist. In most ways, um, his positions seem like positions on the left, right? He's an environmentalist, um, you know, believes in economic equality and all of those things, except that he thinks that, that um, vaccines uh, are unsafe and are hurting us and we shouldn't take them, right? So, it's possible that someone like RFK Jr. could send someone down the rabbit hole. Whether they mean to or not, that person could embrace RFK Jr.'s um, broader views, his broader ideology, but then, oh wait, he's anti-vaccination too? And then they start reading up on anti-vaccination views. Right? They start reading up on evidence about why vaccines are supposedly harmful. And the next thing that you know, they start reading all sorts of other conspiracy theories on the right as well. And so without actually being led down a linear series of belief changes, instead they sort of just jumped. They jumped from the left all the way to the right without stepping down, without stepping anywhere in between. They just sort of leapfrogged over all those other positions. So another example, figures on the right who successfully appealed to mistrust of government by the left during periods of conservative rule. So you probably know who Alex Jones is, this very, very right-wing um, radio host. Um, he, became, he became famous or at least internet famous by making a case that September 11, 2001 was a false flag attack. Right? He, he, he was one of the uh, most prominent early 9-11 uh, truthers. And during this time, because the 9-11 attacks during, happened during the, the administration of George W. Bush, a lot of people who otherwise were seen on the left, you know, thought of themselves as being on the left, sort of bought into this, bought into the 9-11 truther position. And so they became fans of Alex Jones. They started listening to his radio show. And guess what? On ev basically every other position you could possibly think of, he's an extreme right winger. So, and he's also a little bit of a one trick pony. <laughs> so anything that ever happens, his explanation of it is that it's always a false flag attack. Uh, it's always uh, what, you know, whoever led the attack, it wasn't really then, it was really the opposite side doing it to make them look bad. So uh, for instance, he, he made the case that the Sandy Hook massacre was actually done, was either fake or was done by liberals to try to enact gun control legislation. Um, and, I, and, and because this is a, a continuing trope on the right, because this is a, a trope that everything's a false flag attack, um, it was kind of obvious on January 6th when uh, the Capitol was under siege that this was immediately going to be called a false flag attack. Uh, and like clockwork, there it was. You know, people were saying, no, it was actually Antifa who did it. It was actually Black Lives Matter who did it to try to make uh, try to make conservatives look bad. Right? Um, it's just sort of an, an easy, obvious um, conspiracy theory to deploy in any occasion. In any case, um, Alex Jones um, was able to do this right by making the 9-11 truther argument, was able to use that as a kind of a wormhole right, to over from um, the, a, a, a far left position over to a far right position. Uh, another such conduit, and, and this, is not, um, this is not a radical position, uh, but uh, another position is, is free speech. Right? Uh, so the concept of free speech uh, belongs philosophically to the left. Um, some of the great um, philosophers who have made the case for free speech were definitely liberals, uh, but it's, lately it's been deployed rhetorically by the right to win over converts. Um, so, You'll hear um, people on the right, especially people on the, um, the far right, use terms like political correctness and cancel culture to prime audiences for this conversion. 
to make you believe that there's some nefarious elite that's telling us what we're allowed to think and what we're allowed to say. And they, on the other hand, represent common sense. Right? They think the way the rest of us really think. And so you can trust them, you can believe them because they're not shoving all these strange radical views down your throat. Uh, and they stand against political correctness and cancel culture just like you do. Uh, so again, it's identification that is making this, uh, that's making the case, right? This is a person who's like me. They know that all this political correctness is, is a bunch of malarkey, right? So this is also why dominant voices love to claim to be oppressed. Right? They get to pretend that restrictions on free speech um, are intimidation, that they're being silenced. And that's how we end up with things like the war on Christmas, that somehow Christians are not allowed to celebrate Christmas in the United States, which is clearly a ludicrous claim. But by taking the, the um, taking sort of the stance of being oppressed, of being victimized, they then get to say, oh, there's this elite that is keeping us all down. And so we need to all take a stand against this elite. And so this is a, a deliberate conflation, a de deliberate mixing up of the right to speak, the right to say something, and being right in saying something, right? Uh, so um, what is being activated here is uh, the, the sort of joy or the sort of the fun that, that, that some people may get from violating taboos, from saying things that we're not allowed to say, basically just trolling, right? saying things that we don't necessarily believe, but we say them because we know it, ups, it upsets other people and we, watch, we enjoy watching people either be offended or claim to be offended by those things. And I think that's where a lot of the casual trolling, the casual, um, sort of sneering and trolling and nastiness of the alt-right comes from. It comes from that, um, the joy people get from violating that, violating taboos. And so this is a fundamental dilemma. It's a fundamental di dilemma in restricting hate speech. Uh, you can either let it go unchecked and unanswered, right? Or you can create a powerful bogeyman for charlatans who are claiming to stand up for oppressed uh, people, but are in reality just promoting hatred. Right? So obviously it, these, these aren't our only options, right? Obviously, well, hopefully these aren't our only options. Um, we need to have a really, really careful and nuanced understanding of hate speech so that we don't end up sort of just, you know, um, wildly banning hate speech without, without thinking through the consequences, but also we can't just do nothing either. We need to have a very, very careful uh, stance and a very careful reaction. So the case for limits on speech is that the reason free speech is good is that it helps us make better decisions by bringing more voices into discussion. Speech that has the effect of intimidating others, such as hate speech, undermines the more fundamental value of empowering oppressed and minority perspectives. It exploits tolerance in order to spread intolerance. So it pretends to, uh, it pretends to uphold liberal democratic traditions while tearing them down in the process. So finally, I just wanted to suggest uh, ways that we can be sure if in fact, you know, hate speech, there, there needs to be some control, some, some some regulations of hate speech. How can we be sure that we're not just um, stuck in our own bubble, right? We're not just um, acting as political partisans, banning speech that we disagree with, right? And how can we be sure that we can make the case to others that that's not what we're doing? That what we're doing really is principled and is not just being um, a partisan political actor. So we need to ask ourselves the questions. What is, what is the reasoning for why the targets of speech deserve criticism. So is there an, an, an actual reason why, why the person being criticized deserves to be criticized? Or is it based on stereotypes? Is it based on blind hate, right? Um, what is the evidence of their supposed crimes? Is there good evidence? Is the evidence presented in a form that encourages or short circuits critical thinking? Um, so if it is, just something that's supposed to make us angry or make us really 
um, you know, make us fearful? Uh, or is, does it actually present good evidence? Um, if it's designed just to make us fearful and hateful, it's probably not speech that, that you know, is, is worthy of too much effort in protecting, right? Um, does the evidence apply to all members of the group um, or just some members of the group? Um, and does the speech delineate carefully between these two? Um, so does the, does the speech, does the speech um, say that every, every member of a group is guilty of some crime or does it, is it very careful to say exactly who is guilty and who is not guilty? So that's all I have. Let me um, turn it over to um, have a conversation and questions. Thank you all for listening. Excellent, thank you. And what I'd like to do now is open up the floor for some questions. I have a couple of questions that have come through um, to me and a few of them have been about the rabbit hole, the analogy of the rabbit hole, Tiffany, which I think is so accurate. And people wanna know this journey down the rabbit hole so we can go down this really, really dark journey. Is it possible to come out of it? Yeah. Um, um, so it's absolutely possible. Um, there are people who have been instrumental in like distributing like neo-Nazi information. Um, and I mean neo-Nazi and literally like neo-Nazi who like came, not only like came out of it, but like um, now actively work against it. So like what really popular example is Christopher Pitchley. Um, he was like, I think he was in the nineties he uh he's like a young man and he was like kind of radicalized um but he you know he left there have been others um uh oh derek black he was interviewed on um that oh that political why is the name i want to call it it's not the daily show right he's it's, been on several things he has a book he has his yeah name. it was he um it was with trevor noah it's on youtube where like and now he like uh, he's a PhD student um, studying history and he's, you know, uh, again, he like does speaking events. Um, you can absolutely get out of it, um, but that's highly dependent on the individual and why you got there in the first place, so. Okay. Thank you, that was a really helpful answer. Um, now we have a question from Christian. Um, why do conservatives argue that hate speech isn't real or that it's not violent or dangerous? Eric, you can answer that one if you want to try, Eric. I can start. Um, I think it's based on sort of a too literal separation of speech and action. It's the notion that you know, sticks and stones can break my, my bones, but words will never hurt me. Uh, and so this is a very, and this is a very simple way of thinking of, of language. Uh, and it has a certain appeal to it because it is so clean and simple and easy that we can just, you know, just say words are words and actions are actions. But the problem is it's not true. The problem is that um, we, we, we know we've seen this happen over and over again for years now that if you just keep tossing hate out into the world uh, and you just keep, keep referring to people as subhuman and uh, worthless and you just keep making this case over and over again, eventually somebody somewhere is gonna kind of snap and is going to commit a violent act against that group of people. We've seen it, I mean, how many times do we need to see it happen? So the people who are um, using that speech, they don't know exactly who is going to do it. But they don't know that it's going to happen in, you know, in, in a synagogue in Squirrel Hill. They don't know that it's going, you know, exactly where the, um, where the, who the attacker is going to be and who the victims are. But they know that, that it's just a numbers team. game. And if you, if yeah. you, if you say it loud enough and you say it long enough, eventually someone's going to snap and they're going to do it. And it's, and it happens constantly. That's why we have so many, well, it's, it's not every mass shooting in the United States, but it's a lot of the mass shootings and a lot of the, the violence we see against um, all sorts of, um, all sorts of minority groups in the United States. Um, you know, lately, um, 
Asian Americans, of course, have been a, a, a target as as well. And so that takes, I mean, that takes a lot of takes a lot of work to to keep people that hateful. I think you know, there's um, like I think it's honestly, I think it's strange that people still associate the virus with Asian people. I mean, like. Why do people even still have that association? I, I kind of lost that association after the first month or two of the pandemic because I mean, eventually it was everywhere. So why would, why even would, I mean, absent the ethical issue, uh, you, just even on the basis of fact, why would that association even still exist? And it's because so much work is done to make sure that people do still have that association. Um, and uh, the, the question was, why do conservatives tend to downplay the influence of hate speech. Um, there are like, you know, many individuals on the right who will try to downplay um, the presence of this. Like you'll see in comments a lot on like, you know, Facebook, Instagram and stuff saying like, why do you, uh, you know, calling the response alarmist? Like, why are you being alarmist about this? If someone like spray painted a swastika, like that's not a big deal or like, they'll point out um, like um, the racial composition of the atta uh, the tax on Asian people, which itself refers to like a whole like racial situation as well. Um, but I also wanna say that like, in a way we should be thankful for, and this is a weird way to put it, but they are in denial, but there are people on the far right who are like applauding that on and being like, yes, like that is that is exactly what I want. Like, no, keep that up. I'm not gonna deny it. No, like let's keep doing that. And they'll actually um, mock the moderate conservatives and you know uh, turn them into another uh, pretty much like a group of victims as well. So in a way we should try to talk to the moderate conservatives, you know, and like, cause they, they're, you know, there are plenty of moderate conservatives who I think would, would actually be like more understanding, um, you know, and embrace them, try to get them to understand. Great, thank you. And I think it's a really important point, um, thing to item to point out is that hate exists on all sides of the political spectrum, just to make that very clear right now. And for those of us who study you know, the Holocaust, we study cases of genocide, we understand the slippery slope of how it can move back and forth, um, but there is also that way out. And I'm going to pose two more questions. I'm being mindful of everybody's time. The first is um, the topic of trolls, something both of you brought up. Do you have any sense of how many people percentage-wise are actually hardcore believers in the inflammatory things they post online, as opposed to how many of them are trolling. And um, the second question, just to put this out there to give you something to think about, is has COVID-19 changed the way that you research these topics um, or that you think about hate speech? All right, these guys are not just talking. Um, well, so for the, the trolling, there's a difference between someone who will like mock trans people on 4chan or like Kiwi Farms, as opposed to the group of people on 4chan who actively egg on trans people to commit suicide. There's, there's like a group of people on 4chan who will do that. They will like egg them on and encourage them to do so. And it's like funny. Um, so it's like, there actually is, there's like differences between troll behavior. Sometimes the role of online trolls is actually so interesting. It deserves its own topic, but they'll actually cannibalize themselves. If you're caught acting for like most trolls, if you're caught acting like that, you will actually become the victim of their ire as well. You will be seen as acting, um, uh, for lack of a better word, insane and unhinged, which itself is another form of being neuro being atypical and what is referred to as cringe. 
they, it's a whole world where they just will kind of eat each other and like compete. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to like tell you that that part, part of it. Yeah, there's a kind of competition in some circles um, um, to see who can who can sort of take the most extreme language without responding to it in any kind of emotional way. And so it becomes, a, it, it, there's a kind of contest um, um, to see how far you, you, can, you can take things uh, without flinching at how, you know, at how disgusting they've gotten. Um, I don't feel comfortable keep putting a number on, you know, percentage wise. Um, I don't know. Online. I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, there I would be some good um, quantitative the, social science research on that. And in my in my eyes, the amount of like casual trolls is much larger than the amount of dedicated sociopathic trolls. So, but then again, it's like like it's actually not two groups. It's I guess it's more of like a sliding scale. So. and the topic of your research and how that may have been changed because of COVID. And then I have one final parting remark. Um, oh, I'll answer quickly. As far as um, my research changing during COVID, um, we see hate, um, hate crimes on Asians increasing. Um, unfortunately, I, wasn't, I didn't address that in my presentation. Um, according to like this world of like the far right in America, East Asians are actually kind of res respected more. They, they don't tend to get the kind of ridicule. Um, in fact, they become kind of like a bargaining chip to use against um, Black people. Um, so like, you know, the model minority idea, we kind of are a model minority to that group. Um, so that should have been mentioned, I think, in my presentation. It's certainly sped up the process of radicalization. Uh, people have, have had more time in their homes, sitting by themselves online. Uh, they're bored. They don't have much to do. They, um, you know, they, they lose sight of the world beyond their screen. Uh, and so it's much easier for those people to sort of enter this fantasy land and engage in uh, these fantasy chains uh, that, that occur when it comes to imagining what other people are doing and how we can, you know, how we can assert our superior superiority over them and so on. And so it's, uh, it's, it's definitely sped things up as far as the radicalization process. Excellent, thank you. Um, and just in response to a few messages that we've received about people addressing their own internal biases, I think it's important to look at microaggressions um, and the way that we interact with the world around us and then all of our own implicit biases that every single one of us holds, um, what do we do with that? Rather than denying that we hold stereotypes, that we harbor ideas about other groups that are based merely on group membership and not individual actions, I encourage people to look into that. And there is something that was shared that I would just like to let people know about um, an episode on tonight of PBS Frontline called American Insurrection. And the trailer says that it will be examining far right groups and the radicalization related to the January 6th attack in Charlottesville. And so with that, again, we have, we have passed seven o'clock and I thank people for staying on. We know it's a very long day for everybody and for learning with myself and Charlotte. Um, and I'm going to ask if anybody, you know, would like to stick around for a few more minutes to speak with our panelists. I'm sure they'd be happy to oblige. I would, I'd be happy to spend a while, I don't mind. <laughs> And this way we'll allow those who need to leave, um, those who want to stay, who have unanswered questions, will stick around. Um, and otherwise, just thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Eric. Um, thank you, partners, you know, Loretta, Farrell, and Jeremiah Sullivan for helping us bring this program 
to fruition. And I would invite people to really get involved. This week is Unity Week at Cannes University, as well as Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Month. Go on Cougar Link, find out what's going on and participate. The way that we are going to target these biases, we're going to target racism, we're gonna target hate speech is through awareness and education. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night. And again, you are welcome to stay on if you have more questions. And a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Yay. Thanks. You guys have a wonderful night. Yeah.